which is the European headquarters for particle physics. And behind me is the CMS instrument, the compact muon solenoid. Now, the instrument's really interesting for a range of reasons, one of which is the temperatures that are involved in what's happening inside. So today, I've got a lovely French sunny day. The temperature is probably around 20 degrees Celsius. But inside this piece of kit, there are magnets that are used for guiding the particles and focusing the particles. And at the extreme, these magnets operate at a temperature of just above absolute zero. So around two Kelvin ish. And if you remember that absolute zero is minus 273 ish Celsius. OK, I'm a space scientist. I round up or down <laughs> as I like. But what's also happening in here is that the beams of particles have such a high energy, such a large kinetic energy that their equivalent temperature is trillions of Kelvin. And that absolutely dwarfs the kind of temperatures that I normally think about. So the surface of the sun is 6000 Kelvin. The atmosphere of the sun is 2 million Kelvin in there. It is trillions of Kelvin and that's why when these beams collide at that point it's hot and that's why they call it a hot spot. Welcome to the cavernous entrance hall of the CMS experiment and you can see just over my shoulder there is a life-size picture of the detector itself and running below my feet actually shown by this yellow line you can see the path of the protons that are whizzing around the Large Hadron Collider and that collide in the centre of this experiment. Now the reason this experiment is so famous is it's because experiments that took place here led to the discovery of the Higgs boson. And if you want to find out more about that particle, you can have a look at some of the other Cosmic Shamble videos. Now this piece of kit, I mean, it's an enormous detector. And it's not just about the science of what happens here because there were new technologies and new materials that had to be made in order for this instrument to be able to work. So for example, I found out earlier on that a new crystal was designed, a lead tungsten crystal, which is actually completely transparent. It's a really interesting material to look at. Now, the reason that this crystal was developed is because it's used to measure the energies of the particles made in the collisions that take place here. So the particles, the collisions happen, the mess of particles comes out. Particle physicists might not want me to call it that way. But all these particles come out and you have to measure their energies. So what happens is they get absorbed into this lead tungsten crystal it causes the crystal to glow and that light is detected and it allows you to work out the energy of the particles that went in. So this place has gone down in history because of the Higgs boson. But I want to find out what's happening today. What is taking place 100 metres below my feet right now? This animation shows the path that the protons take. So you can see the small ring and then the large ring is the really famous one that's 27 kilometres across. The protons start down at the bottom, close to where Atlas is, and uh, that's actually where we're staying. But today we are nine kilometres away at the top, and that's where CMS is located. Oh, I just remembered, one of the things I want to do here is check my compass. Okay, north is pointed right roughly straight ahead of me. Um, the reason for doing that will become apparent later on. So I'm joined here by my husband, Matt Parker, who you might know from some YouTube channel talking about numbers Nazi or something stuff. like that. And um, so you're going to be doing your video. I'm just tagging uh, along to do some stats. Yep. Whilst I'll be learning about physics, and uh, we're joined here by Chinchu. So he's our guide in taking us uh, deep underground into CMS itself. If you follow me. Okay, thank you. Uh, right through. So to your left, you should be able to get a sense of how oh, deep wow. underground we are. <laughs> that is a long way up. <laughs> Did you? Well, we are very long way down. Yeah, one of the other. Oh, wow. The main reason why the LHC is so deep underground, for example, if you go to, um, to the outskirts of Chicago where Tevitron used to operate, this was the previous record holder for the highest energy collisions uh, operating at Fermilab, um, 
That is just below the surface of the Earth. You can kind of see the curvature of the accelerator by the kind of ground that you're, you're standing on. Um, the reason the LHC is so deep underground is because this area was quite mushy when the ice retreated after the Ice Age. So it's only once you go about 70 meters underground that you hit the molasse, which is the hard rock, rock that is hard enough for us to build an accelerator in. And that's one of the things that I was telling you about. Right? We can detect earthquakes happening in New Zealand. We can detect the position of the moon. We can detect when trains are traveling and so forth. So we need to have this machine in extremely hard rock so that it does not fluctuate at all. It does not move very much. So that's, that's why the LHC is as deep underground as it is. So that is the safest place in case of an emergency. Because the emergencies we, we don't expect, but the emergencies we're prepared for are gas leaks. Because we store uh, nitrogen and, and helium under pressure here. And if there were a leak, then that would yeah. be what fills up our breathable air. So that's where we head into. And then there's actually a stairwell that goes behind the elevator shaft. Not this one here, but one inside the pressurized zone. Oh, right. So you which, can breathe. Yeah. But we, so use that that, we use that as a breakout area in case we have too many people trying to evacuate. Yeah. Then they go up the stairs to have some space before they take the lift. You, this underground area is some of the only places on the earth where the instructions in case of an, an emergency are, do not take the stairs, take the lift. Get the yeah. lift. Yeah. Which so is, do you have nitrogen monitors around this place? Then yes, the there are. Um, there are. Um, I'll show you one. They're called oxygen deficiency monitors, and they're all around the site. And then they will flash, and they, they detect them when the oxygen level goes below two stages. So at one point, it's, you need to start moving, and the other point is critical. Yeah. So that's when the alarms sound. Yeah. This is sort of where the, where the detector control systems and so forth operate from. So we have all of this electronics that is embedded within the detector. And then we're controlling them. We're making sure that the, that the temperatures are correct. We're making sure that the, that, this, that the detector components are working as they should, that the signals are arriving, and so forth. So is this the brains of um, You can think of it in that sense, yeah. This seems like you can think of it as the brains. Actually, another way of um, the, the real brains, which is where the data analysis is done, is located upstairs. But this is part of the nervous system, so to, yeah. so to speak, yeah. It's what's, uh, it's what's controlling all of the subsystems, making sure that their power supplies are working OK, that the cooling systems are working OK, that the that the sensors themselves are functioning normally and so forth. So, and yeah. it's quite a significant sized room. Yeah, we have one above this as well. So there are two rooms like this. Um, and they're all devoted, they're dedicated to specific sub-detectors. So as I told you earlier, that CMS is made up of different sub-detectors from the inside to the outside. And each of those subsystems has a separate monitoring system because some of them need to be cooled to very low temperatures, some of them need to be operating at room temperatures and so forth. So all of these are um, devoted, dedicated to specific sub-detectors of CMS. So we're also, as I was just telling Matt earlier, that we're standing right now in the underground service cavern, and there's an experimental cavern on the other side. And these yeah. two caverns were excavated at the same time. And we happened to remove about 200,000 cubic meters of earth from these right. caverns, which weighed, give or take, about 14,000 tons, OK, 14 million kilograms. So we removed 14 million kilograms of earth, and we put in a 14 million kilogram detector in its place, right? But the detector is in one room. So this room is lighter than it was before, yeah. and that room is heavier than yeah, it was before. Yeah. So this is an air bubble that wants to go to the surface, and that one wants to sink underground. So the wall that you see on the other side is a seven meter thick wall that is filled with concrete. And that provides a mechanical rigidity to hold this cavern and that cavern in place. Huh, so you've got like a sort of retaining wall in between yeah. your two sections. Yeah, it just, it just holds them in place. Yeah. And, and it also does a very good job of, of shielding this room from the radiation produced by the collisions in that room. So the seven meters of concrete essentially prevent any of the radiation from getting in here, which is why we can come on the ground. See, I'm surprised that you don't have a concrete plant at CERN. Because everywhere you go, there's concrete We're using to concrete. protect the humans and the machinery, presumably, from these particles that are being created. I am now stood directly underneath uh, my position in the cabin upstairs, and I'm facing in the same direction as well. So if you remember, my compass pointed north, sort of straight ahead of me. So imagine I've got the picture of CMS behind my back. But what's important about this position is that I am as close to CMS as I can possibly safely get. And CMS has an enormously strong magnet, so it produces a really strong magnetic field, and I want to see if I can pick it up with my compass. So let me open the Compass app. Ah, OK, so there we go. Now, I'm facing where due north was upstairs. And so I think it's moved by about 30 degrees or so. i just move my smartphone around. Yeah, OK, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. So I think I can say that I have detected the magnetic field of CMS and I can prove that CMS is working. Oh, actually saying that, now my phone has gone into Calibrate. It's actually not very happy. 
I'm 100 metres underground now and sadly I can't get into the tunnel itself because scientists are doing their experiments so I'm kind of cheating it here you can see this is where the proton beam goes this is obviously a photo of it but quite frankly it's as good as I'm going to get but what is exciting is I'm joined by Achintia so come in and join me here thank you for coming and chatting with me, to me today so tell me what is your position here um, so I work as a science communicator for the CMS collaboration and I'm doing a PhD in science communication at the moment um, studying the collaborations attitudes towards public engagement and what's exciting, I think, is that at this facility, there are still lots of experiments being run. I mean, particle physics didn't end with the yeah. discovery of the Higgs boson. So what kind of things are you looking at today? Well, the LHC was you know, designed in order to find the Higgs boson if it exists at the time, when it, when it was conceptualized that if this particle exists, this machine should find it. And of course, we did five years ago, um, almost to the day, like July 2015, in 2012, we found the Higgs boson, right? And at the time, we weren't sure if it was the boson that was predicted by the theorists or not. And then eventually, we confirmed that, yes, this is, in fact, one of the particles we expected. I yeah. do remember when the discovery came out, it felt like scientists were kind of covering their backs because they said, oh, it's um, a Higgs-like boson. And yeah. I remember thinking, what should I call it? So yeah. have we confirmed, was it the Higgs boson that was found? Yeah, so it is, in fact, a Higgs boson in as much as we know. So the standard model predicts that this particle should exist. And when it was first observed, we didn't know all of its properties very well. Um, and in the five years since, we've managed to, to nail down some of the properties in terms of what does this particle transform into? Does it, how often does it, go, does it transform into two photons? How often does it transform into two Z bosons, etc.? And as we learn more about the particle, we develop a greater certainty that this is, in fact, yes, this is a Higgs boson. We, we've dropped the like from, from the terminology. But in terms of what it, what, what it is that we're doing right now, well, the, the Higgs boson was just the first step in, in, in a vast journey for this machine. It's, we, don't, we don't just call it a day when we come across the first island when we're out in the ocean. We want to see what, what else is out there. And we know that there's a lot that is, un, that is unanswered in terms, of, uh, in terms of particle physics. Um, there are unanswered questions about um, whether the universe has as many dimensions as we've observed or, are there, or there are more. We know from the observation of galaxies that um, there's a lot of mass that, that appears to be missing. There's, this is what we call dark matter, that galaxies should be rotating at a certain speed, but they're rotating at a different speed, which can only be explained if there's something in there that we cannot observe. There are predictions that this might come from um, particles that are called supersymmetric particles, which we hope to produce here at CERN. So we're looking for extra dimensions, we're looking for supersymmetry, we're trying to understand the nature of gravity as well, and how this plays in with the, with the three forces that we have an understanding of. So it's just the first step in many ways, and, and What's great about finding the Higgs boson is that it gives us another tool in our tool chain for exploring the universe. So every time humanity has made a new discovery, when we've discovered a new particle, it has, it has proven itself to be uh, another tool for us to conduct our explorations. We went from you know, regular microscopes to electron microscopes, and maybe we'll have a Higgs micro microscope someday. It's hard to tell, but it's quite exciting. Because I think it's really important to think about this place as being an experiment, and it is a phenomenal mm. experiment with thousands of people involved. Mm. One of the things I often hear about that catches my ear as a space scientist is that you are effectively recreating the early universe. Mm -hmm. here. What does that actually mean? So what we try and do here is essentially smash things together and see what happens at the LHC. We, we smash together protons. And then we see what happens. And what we're able to do by having these collisions is we're able to produce some of the particles that have not freely existed since the beginning of the universe itself. Now, most particles in nature that we know of, they are what we can think of as unstable particles. They have a mass that is, that is um, they have a certain mass, and, and it gives them a sort of un instability that they want to lose. They want to transform into something of a lower mass, something that gives them a more stable state. It's like they don't want to be on the higher rungs of the ladder. They want to climb down to the lowest rungs of the ladder. And, and I think that kind of intuitively makes sense, because I, I think about particles as being a collection of subparticles. They have structure. And if you build something that's mm. of a certain size, it wants to break apart. Is, is that the way to think about it? So some particles indeed do have a substructure to them. So we know that a proton or a neutron, which people are, people are familiar with as being part of the nucleus of, of all of our atoms, they have a substructure. There, there are quarks inside of the, the, prot uh, the protons and the neutrons. But electrons, for example, as far as we know, in as much as we were able to understand them, don't have any substructure. So it's not necessarily that they're breaking down into smaller particles. It's that they're transforming into lighter particles by emitting something else. 
it, it's, it's not a concept that we should think of in terms of the macroscopic universe that we have. The, 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 the sort of quantum universe that we have is, is vastly different. And all of our analogies tend to break down when we think of them. But um, to, to answer your question, what happens in the early universe is that all these particles are produced when energy transformed into matter. And all the, all the heavier particles de transform into lower particles, and, and they no longer exist freely or you know, in, in, large, in large quantities in abundance. So what we do at the LHC is we, we create these collisions that have the probability of producing those particles that we have not seen freely since the beginning of the universe for 14 billion years. And by producing those particles, we can then understand what the universe behaved like all those years ago. So it's kind of like creating sort of mini Big Bangs. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a good way of thinking of it because we're not creating the Big Bang. We're creating conditions microseconds after the Big Bang. But by creating those conditions, we can test our theories of physics. We can test our knowledge of physics. We can, we can find a grasp of, OK, we have all of these models that explain how particles behave, how forces interact with the particles, and how particles interact with one another. And in order to test them, we can use the LHC as a laboratory. And so you're talking about very small particles, and mm -hmm. you're talking about short-lived particles as yeah. well. So it's uh, sorry, my hat is jumping around all, all over the place. So we're, we're thinking about small physics, and we're thinking about fast physics. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I understand the small, but how do you deal with the fast here? I mean, how do you make measurements of these particles that might live for only a very short amount of time that you're creating by having these very rapid collisions? That, that's, an, that's an excellent question. So most of the time, the particles that are produced, they survive for microns before they transform into something else. So if, if you collide two protons and the, the quarks or the gluons inside of them will interact and they will produce, let's say, a Higgs boson, the Higgs boson is a very short-lived particle. Almost immediately after it is produced, it transforms into something else. It becomes, let's say, two Z bosons. And the Z bosons are also light-lived particles. So they then transform into, let's say, two electrons uh, each. So you have four electrons, right? So now you have four electrons in your detector that you observed. And you need to figure out where did those electrons come from. Can you pair two and two of them to say they came from a Z boson? each, and then can you pair the Z bosons together to say they came from a Higgs boson. And this is, this is sort of like, it's, it's detective work. You, you look through fragments of what, what, has, uh, what has been produced in the collisions. You can't see the particle that was produced. You see its signatures. You see its transformation products and its transformation products. And through that, you can recreate, taking steps back, you can figure out what has happened there. And of course, it's a game of probability. So when we, when we smash two protons together, about once every second, we can produce a Higgs boson, but we don't see all of them. Um, sometimes our detectors are not, we are not, we're not looking for those particles, or they, they, they transform into particles so rarely that we don't see the transformation products very often. So it's a game of statistics. Yeah. We have to acquire a lot of data in order to see this. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a great question, because for example, when the Higgs boson was discovered five years ago, both CMS and ATLAS, the other big general purpose detector here, had to sift through something like 500 trillion proton-proton collisions. Wait, so how do you go about doing, doing that? I mean, this is big data, yeah. big scheme. Do you automate it? Do you have some detection algorithm? You can chuck the data into your computer and it will throw out the stuff that is least likely to be important and keep the stuff which is most likely to be important? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We have to do that because um, we cannot store all of the data that are produced in these collisions. Every time the protons interact, uh, every, time they, every time your two bunches of protons hit each other, right? This takes place 40 million times a second. 40 okay. million times a second, right? <laughs> 40 million times a second. And then you've got to have a camera. So I keep inter yeah, inter yeah. interjecting because it's so interesting. But then you've got to have a camera that can have a frame rate which is able to pick this kind of speed up. Absolutely. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily shoot let's say 40 million times uh, a second of everything that's taking place, but we have, we have something known as a triggering system, right? So if you were to try and store all of the data coming out 40 million times a second, each of those collision events is give or take about one to two megabytes. So in one second, you're looking at producing 80 terabytes of data, which is just something we cannot store. Like humanity as a species cannot store this. So we have to decide, as you rightly point out, what is interesting, what potentially shows us something new, and what is entirely uninteresting and boring and we can just get rid of it. So we have a triggering system that looks at the collisions at, of, um, at the lowest level possible. So an one of your detectors will say, I see a high energy electron flying through me. This is potentially an interesting collision event. OK, so I see a high, en high energy electron flying through me. This is potentially interesting. Let's send this for further analysis. And then you send those selected events to a computing farm located upstairs. 
which then puts all the pieces together. Right, you see a high energy electron. What's happening elsewhere in the detector? It puts those pieces together, and then it decides whether the collisions are worth storing or not. And the rate at which we do this is quite fascinating. So we take 40 million collision events per second, throw away 39.9 million Ooh. collision events per second immediately. Okay. We're then left with 100,000 out of 40 million, which we send from the detectors to the computing firm says That then looks at it, puts the pieces together, and says, OK, you know, this might be, there's potentially new physics here for us to explore, or there's measurements for us to, for us to make. And then that stores about 400 to 1,000, let's say, per second. From 40 million, we're storing about 400. And the rest of the data are thrown away immediately. They're discarded. There isn't a recycle bin you can go and right click on and say, you know, get me my data back. I was back. just thinking, can, can we have that? You know, maybe there's something in there that if we just had the, the power and the capacity to search through, maybe, maybe there's some real nuggets. So th there's two, things, two ways to look at it. One of the things is, as you rightly point out, we, you know, maybe there's something that we haven't thought of. So the, the way in which this triggering system works is we program it in. The scientists program it in. Mm -hmm. They decide what it is that we're looking for, what signatures are we looking for. Are they electrons? Are they, you know, based on the theories and the predictions that the theory gives us, we decide what to store and what to throw away. But of course, nature might just have stuff out there that we have not expected. So we do a sort of random sampling. Every so many seconds, we just store the collision event independent of what it shows us. So then we can go through the, those randomly that's, sampled data. That's and a really interesting point, because it, you're right. If we don't have the right theory developed in order to make the prediction to look for a particular particle, yeah. you could miss that serendipitous discovery yeah. if you don't have the data. The other thing I want to ask you about is the name. So mm -hmm. we are in the compact muon solenoid. Yeah. We haven't mentioned the solenoid yet or, or the muon. So where does the name come from? And, okay, and what so physics is happening um, in, in that area? So I'll start with the first letter of the name, right? Now CMS is, is about 15 meters high, 15 meters wide, and about 21 meters long. It's about a five-story building's height. So when we call it a compact detector, we're actually pointing out the fact that by the standards of modern particle detectors, it is quite compact. All of the, all of the material is smushed into a very small, very narrow yeah, space. It doesn't sound very compact at that size. But, it, but you have to bear in mind that this weighs 14,000 tons, 14 million kilograms. So it's a lot of detector material in a very small space, relatively small space. And the muon and the solenoid are, have to do with the sort of physics signatures we're looking for. Now, muons don't interact very much with matter. So when we see muons in our detector, we can get very so-called clean signatures of whatever physics has been produced and, at the, and at the collision. And muons are a fundamental particle. That's right. Like so an electron. Muons are heavier cousins of an electron, absolutely. They have all, essentially all the same properties of an electron, but they're about 200 times heavier than an electron. And they don't interact with matter. So in our detector, we have multiple layers of detection material. And the muons generally fly through the inner layers without leaving any major signature. And then we can detect them on the outskirts of CMS. So, that way, we're able to then get fairly clean signatures and, and study the physics phenomena that has taken place. So this detector was conceptualized around having a muon detection system that is you know, top, of its, top of its class, um, the best that we can have. And of course, the solenoid is, is our magnet, uh, which is at the heart of the detector. It's, it, it's what forms, well, it's, it's, a, it's a cylindrical detector, a cylindrical magnet with coils of wires which we pass a lot of electricity through. And when we pass electricity through them, it becomes a magnet. And this is something that everybody probably did, if, well, particularly if they did A-level physics yeah. in Britain. That's part of the syllabus. Yeah. You have the coil, you yeah. pass the current. You if you've just taken a nail, wrapped insulated wire around it, connected it to a 9-volt battery, you've made, you a, made solenoid. a solenoid. Yeah, we make the same thing on a slightly bigger scale. Uh, we pass about 18,500 amperes of current through this okay. to generate a magnetic field of about 4 tesla, which is around 100,000 times the magnetic field of the Earth. Okay. So for Tesla, so I, yeah, I study the sun, and we're a bit mm -hmm. weird in astrophysics in that we use Gauss okay. for our flux density. So I think it's one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss, so that's 40,000 40, okay. Gauss. And then I want to make a translation to the magnetic fields we see on the sun, which are at the strongest, maybe a few thousand Gauss. So you are mm. an order of magnitude stronger than the magnetic fields that I would normally talk about, which I would boast as being pretty strong. Well, it's also the scale. I imagine that the ones on the sun are a, are a lot larger than the ones That's that we true. have here. That's true. We trump so, on scale. Yeah. That's true. So we can get much higher uh, magnetic field magnets. So the LHC's magnets itself, that th these blue things that we see behind us that are bending the particles as they fly around the ring, they go to eight Tesla. So they are twice as, uh, they have twice the magnetic field that CMS does. But you can also see that they're much smaller in, in the size. Mm -hmm. So they produce a magnetic field in a much smaller volume. For CMS, we need to produce a magnetic field on about, as I said, 15 meters, 20, 21 meters, and 15 meters across. So that's the challenge for this magnet. So if you were to sum up in, I don't know, let's say three words, the physics that's happening today, 
Could you do that? Probably not, but I think if I can get four words in, okay, I would say four. search for new physics. Does that work? That does. I'm happy with that. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. My I think pleasure. we can see that actually it's such a vibrant area. New dimensions, new particles, new physics. It's still happening right here, right now at CERN. Well, I have had a phenomenal time here at CERN learning about what's happening because of the particles accelerated in this tunnel. But if you want to find out more about the maths of what's happening here and the maths related to these activities, go to the Stand Up Maths channel for Matt Parker's video.